Okay, so I've got, um, when they do the clock, which I'm about to do in a minute, I've got 35 minutes to talk to you about cloud, which is the chief cloud technologist at VMware. You think I should be able to. Uh, there will be no sales in this pitch, I promise you. What I'm going to tell you is what I'm seeing in the business. Now, my job is two things. First thing is setting our strategy as a company with regards to products and technology with the other 10 people in the office of the CTO. The other part of my job is talking to customers and partners and CIOs about what's going on today. And so today I'm going to share with you what I've got and what our thinking is around what we've seen from CIOs. So the first thing, if you want to get to present at a conference anywhere in the world, is to put a slide in your presentation with that on it. Okay? Because consumerization is a hot topic. Everyone wants to hear about consumerization of IT. Because consumerization, well, consumerization, I'm English and I can't say it. Because consumerization of IT is actually what's not happening. What's happening is something very different. It's because users traditionally are very good at something. They're good at something called subversion. Now, subversion for the non-English speakers and you may not know, is going against your masters, doing what you're not told. I like to call it the user spring, okay? Goes with the Arab spring that we keep hearing about at the moment as well. Now, what this is, is users doing things that IT don't want them to, and they've done it for a long time. Back in the 1980s, they bought an IBM PC because they didn't want to wait to use the mainframe. And then in the 1990s, they didn't want to wait to use Oracle or Sybase and talk to a DBA, so they used Microsoft Access because someone told them it was a database. And then in the last 10 years, they've been using something called SharePoint to build websites because they can't wait for IT to build them websites. And now we have a lot of very bad websites. And so you, I only use Microsoft examples because I used to work for Microsoft, so I'm allowed to. Now, there's a lot of people continually going down this path of not doing what IT wants them to. The challenge is they now have new and interesting ways to do it. And if we look back at how my company was back in 1995, I think 94, when I was at Hewlett Packard, and I was one of the developers on OpenView, for which I'm really sorry. Um, and then I had one logon, my logon to my company, my username and password for HP. Now the change is very, very simple about what's going on in IT today. We don't have users anymore. When it was the mainframe, when it was defended, and when there were very intelligent people running the computer systems and you were privileged to be able to use the computers, you were called a user. Now, we have consumers. We don't have users anymore. The users cannot be kept um, in the dark by us anymore. They've seen the light. They've seen outside. They've seen what they can do. They've come in with an iPhone. And now they want services from you the same way that they get services from all the other people that provide them digital services. And when you can't do it, they want to know why. And in fact, if you look at how my life has changed and how I now view my digital life, and this is how your users, now consumers, view their digital life, it looks something like this. They have Gmail which is where I do my personal email. We have Dropbox, which is where I store documents for my personal use and family, etc. We have Facebook, which is where I lie to my friends. We have NatWest, which up until last week when their computer systems crashed very big was where my money was. It still is at the moment, I think, though they can't tell me. Um, and Twitter, which is where I'm honest with strangers. And down the bottom there is my company, one provider of many services. Would you like to know how many providers I have? 274. I have a piece of software that logs all the usernames and passwords I have for different sites and makes them all different and unique. I have 274 unique usernames and passwords for things on the internet. And that's not just because I was a geek before it was cool to be a geek. You all know this. When you go to a website to buy something, they want a new username and password. So your users are now looking at the service you provide as just that, a service, and comparing it against other services they've got. 
This is an interesting one to me. You, being of the age and experience you will have, should know what that is. My 11-year-old daughter doesn't know what that is. She saw that written down and asked me, Daddy, what does that smiley mean? She thought it should be like the brackets and the smiley face. Is this an angry guy? Um, because her life is very different. And it's not just 11-year-old children. I deal with developers on a daily basis, which is an interesting thing to do. I grew the beard so they'd understand me. Um, and I had a guy about two years ago, I asked him in California to mail me some documentation, or just give me some documentation. He sent it to me on Dropbox. And I thought nothing of it. I was an early user of Dropbox. I didn't have a problem with it. Fine. And then a bit later on, I asked him, why did you use Dropbox? Why didn't you use the file share that we have for the project? And this guy, who was a 23-year-old Stanford master's graduate, Java programmer, looked at me and said, what's a file share? And this really underlined to me that what's happened is we built a desktop in the 1970s. And we called it a desktop because we were trying to make computers easy for people to use that had never seen technology like that before. So we made documents and folders and recycle bins and the desktop itself and many other things that made it look like the way they work today in the office of the 1970s. My children don't work in the office of the 1970s. People in their 20s don't work in the office of the 1970s. They do when they come to your company because you give them a Windows XP desktop from 12 years ago, is that? Because what happens is the desktop operating system is what's suffering because we don't need them anymore. Users out there are not using desktop operating systems. There's no attachment to them where there was before. And in fact, the users are deconstructing the desktop operating systems for us. They're taking the way they interact with applications and their data and moving it onto multiple devices. Think about that. Are they? Of course they are. Five years ago, if I had told one of your users that they didn't need Microsoft Office anymore and they could still get their job done, they would have laughed at you and said, no, I need Microsoft Office. It's my life. Now, they've learned with the iPad, Android, and others, and documents to go, and pages, and in fact, in Google Docs, what they actually need is a way to edit documents with the extension dot doc. They don't need Office, and in fact, some of them are moving away from using documents entirely. They've also got fed up with having to come into the network to get to their files. So they've taken all of your data, and they've put it in different places. They've put it on the public cloud. They've put it on the private cloud. So over the last five years or so, your consumers, who you used to call users, have been deconstructing your IT environment for you. They've been taking their data and the way they interact with their applications to work the way that they want to in this new market of one, which I'll talk about in a bit. Because really, the way that they are asked to work in organizations now is irrelevant to the way they've been brought up with IT. My mother is coming to IT for the first time in her late 60s. She has never, ever really worked with files and folders. She was given an iPad. She's off. She does everything she needs to do, email, Facebook, and watching YouTube, which is strangely the same that my children do. In fact, my children don't do email because that's old stuff. Old people do email. They do something else. And this trend is actually meaning that the applications that are being deployed in enterprises are becoming more and more operating system and browser neutral. I run and take part in a lot of events with CIOs, and I've recently done a round trip of dinners around Europe with CIOs, hence the shape. Um, uh, I, think I've, oh, I think I'm 14 now, I think. And each one's 15, 20, 25 CIOs from major organizations. And we have one here in Paris not long ago on the Champs-Élysées. And I always ask the question, if you were given a brand new company tomorrow with 5,000 users, never existed before, Greenfield, would you roll out Windows desktops or even Linux desktops? 
not one hand goes up because they've realized something. No one's writing for Windows anymore. No one's even writing for that bit of the middle, by the way, which is IE6, which is where things were tied to a particular browser. People are developing in HTML5, uh, Silverlight, Adobe Air, various other technologies, JVM, that allow them to spread across multiple clients because they now have the realization that they have to have access for their consumers, whether they're internal or external, on any device, anywhere. And that sets up an interesting problem for people because in IT, we've taught ourselves that we have to own everything and we have to manage everything, don't we? That's what you have to do. If you don't manage it, then it's not secure, okay? Wrong. Five years ago, if I'd come into your company with an iPhone and said, hello, I'd like to have the company's CRM system on my iPhone, the IT department would have gone, no. I would have been okay with that because that's what I'm used to the IT department saying because they are the department of no, run by Dr. No, who just says no a lot, um, not a problem. And now I go back with my iPhone and say, I'd like to access the company CRM system on my iPhone. And they say no, and I go, why not? And they go, because I can't manage your device. I can't secure your device. I've been to a brilliant conference on mobile device management, and we can't manage those yet. Why do you need to manage my device, is my answer. On this phone, I have an application from my bank that allows me to transfer money, check my bank accounts, and pay my children, which is all I seem to do. Okay. At the same time, I have various other methods of payment that are secure for my life access to many different things that are way more secure and important to me and probably to the people who are giving me that service than your silly CRM system. There is a way, go find it. And that's the challenge I'm having CIOs come to me. So the answer is stop trying to put your arms around everything, give up, retreat, think again, and deliver differently. I hear a lot about this talk in manifesting itself as the end of the corporate LAN or the Kill the Land project, as it's called at one of my customers, where they've realized that um, not only do they not need desktops anymore. Interestingly, have you noticed we replace desktop operating systems the same way we replace our socks? Have you noticed that one? You don't replace a desktop operating system because it's better than the old one and gives you differentiation and business value. I don't replace my socks because they're better than my old socks. I replace my socks because my wife looks at me and says, you can't go out in those socks anymore with holes in them like that. I'm buying you new socks. That's what happens in IT departments. We had XP. It works. It works really well. We've built fantastic processes around it. We've hardened it. It's great. Vista came along. Meh. Right? Well, why would I bother spending money moving to Vista? Because XP works. And now Windows 7 comes along, and people are like, meh. Windows 7, really? Do we need that? XP's working fine, and now someone's going, oh, no, there's holes in that now. Yeah, no, there aren't. Yes, we're going to put holes in it. We're going to stop supporting it. So what happens is people are now saying, I'm not going to buy any more socks anymore. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to make my users buy their own socks. And that's the end of the corporate land. Why do you manage and secure a huge corporate network? Why don't you shrink back to a data center and just have the internet in your offices, as many companies are doing now? Why do you need a corporate LAN? Think about what it is in your organization that requires you to have a corporate network. Earlier on, um, you saw, uh, I can't remember the speaker talking about cybersecurity, putting up companies that have been hacked. Pretty much every single one of those, including one of them that I know for sure, was hacked by someone with a compromised device on the corporate LAN. Yeah? I've got a friend, um, Graham Cluley, actually, Sophos, very cool. Give you a little story. He went to a company I can never tell you the name of, but he got a bunch of USB keys, and he wrote salary information on the USB key and threw the USB keys randomly in the car park. Within 23 minutes, he had control of eight PCs in that organization and could get to any information he wanted to. It's not good, huh? But if you start to think, okay, let's shrink back, let's not manage these. One, I don't have to manage things anymore. My job now is to think, how do I securely deliver applications and data to any device, like a bank? Now, I assume every device that comes to me is full of viruses and compromised, and I deal with that in my own way. I only have to worry about my data centers 
and the service provision I do in that. Because outside of that is just the internet, whether it's in an office that someone's sitting in that happens to be in a building that I own, or lease, or not, it's the internet. You also stop having the, oh, I'm sorry, I thought I was on the VPN conversations with users as well. The only thing you really need to be on the VPN for nowadays in organizations is to access the file servers. Well, no one uses those anymore. And also to um, print, but you can do that now through the internet anyway. So pretty much not much. I don't go on the VPN at our company. So now this puts you in an interesting position because the clouds come along. And so if you look at your business user here, traditionally they've had a relationship with the man from IT. And the man from IT has been in a very, very good place because he is the sole supplier. And if he says yes, it's possible. And if he says no, it's not possible. And that's the end of the story. And so for now, from then until now, she has just been giving all her money to IT. There you go. Do this. Make it work. And then in the last few years, what's happened is she has been and played golf or read magazines or whatever with some other people who said, hey, there's this really cool stuff we've heard out called IaaS and SaaS and PaaS and cloud and stuff. And apparently, it's really cheap and easy to use. And so now she's going, ooh, that's interesting. Maybe I can give money to both of those. Now, he's now sad because he's losing his job because she's giving all his work to her, to the other people. So what does he say? It's not secure. It's not scalable. It won't work with our processes. When in fact, what he should be doing is working out, how do I turn my infrastructure into looking like that stuff? How do I deliver it the same way as that, better, tailored to my business? And then I sit in the middle. And I stop being what's called the chief infrastructure officer and become, once again, the chief information officer and the chief integration officer. Because what we've developed in IT is this expertise in stuff we don't need to do anymore called infrastructure. And really what cloud has done has meant that we don't have to worry about infrastructure anymore. We have a whole bunch of people who are really, really good at building stuff that has been commoditized and standardized. So now, as a CIO or a CEO, or a geek or a boss, you have to understand how are you going to look at providing IT as a service? IT comes down to these four words, in my mind anyway. Platforms to build services. That's all people want. Back in the 1970s, when you wanted a mainframe, why did you want a mainframe? Because you wanted to run an application. Who wanted the application? The business. Who could provide that? Well, we had to have an IT department to build the data center. And then we became experts in data centers. Then we became experts in putting stuff in data centers. Then we became experts at operating stuff in data centers and building infrastructure. And then people needed to access that data. So we needed to build a network so they could connect it, because there wasn't one. So we became experts in networks. And suddenly, we became experts in building entire huge lumps of IT infrastructure, when all we actually wanted was something to run our accounting app on. But because there was no other option, we had to build it ourselves. Now, what's happened is that was the good days, OK? The good days was when we were automating a manual process, and IT could do no wrong, and were brilliant, and were saving money, and adding value, and there was no question. Then we hit the nasty phase, which we're still kind of in now, when you go to an organization, and on the left-hand side, there's infrastructure and operations who are really good at their job. On this side, there's the business people who know what they want. And in the middle, we have created an entire business, whatever you want to call it, industry, around cost-cutting, optimization, and efficiency. And in fact, there are people today whose entire job in IT has been trying to find new and interesting ways to say no to people as to why they can't do something because they can't afford it or we don't do it that way. So why am I saying all this? Well, the platforms to build services piece is very interesting because it's what's scaring people today. Because if I'd gone to Blockbuster 10 years ago and said, do you know what? There's a company you've never heard of going to come along and completely destroy you and change your business using technology they probably wouldn't have believed me. Now, Netflix has come along and completely changed the marketplace and takes by far the lion's share of all internet traffic at the same time. Now, when they went looking for a platform, do you think they tried building it themselves first? No, they did actually, to be honest. Adrian did build a bit of himself, but he realized he needed scale, massive scale, tens of thousands of servers. 
He was not going to do that himself. So what he did was he out-innovated Blockbuster. Amazon out-innovated the traditional bookstores. The bookstores could have done it. Blockbuster could have done it. But can you imagine what those meetings were like at Blockbuster? Yeah, I've got this really good idea. We're going to try this new exciting service where we're going to rent 10,000 servers off someone else and spin them up and down on demand, and we're going to stream video. And someone probably sat there and said, that's not our core competency as a business. Uh, we don't do that. We don't have expertise in that. Our technical people can't do that. We do things this way. And so the CIOs I talk to today are the people trying to break out of that cycle. Because what's happened is, when I go out and talk to them, there's two types of reporting line. There's the old reporting line, which is where the CIO reports to the chief financial officer. That tells you that the CIO and his entire organization are a cost center, a necessary evil, and a non-differentiating mess, as far as, IT, as far as the business is concerned. The other organizations, the CIO reports to the CEO. And the CIO maybe even has a seat at the board. Those are the organizations where the CIO is seen as an agent of business change, someone who can come to the business and say, I've got a cool idea on how we can use technology to outsmart our competitors. Because the challenge now is, and the previous presentation was a really good lead in, cloud and the technologies available in cloud mean that someone on his own in his bedroom can build a hundred light bulbs that don't work, trying to find the one light bulb that does work, in the same time that your organization can probably start the scoping process for possibly maybe having a meeting about thinking about possibly designing a light bulb at some point in the next year. And that's what's happening. So how do you transform your business? And how do you transform your thinking to take advantage of this? And what is cloud, anyway? Cloud is a fantastic marketing term. Um, you'll notice a lot of people have put cloud on everything. Um, there's a very simple test as to whether it's cloud or not. Okay? If someone says something and you can take the word cloud and replace it with the word internet, then it's probably not cloud. It's probably just internet with cloud written on it, okay? which you see a lot of. Now. I obligatory have to have a slide up with lots of very small words on because I don't like them, okay? But what you'll hear is these surveys that come back telling you, oh, cloud leads directly to business agility and we need business agility because apparently that's what I've been told when I read the magazines is that business agility is what I need and cloud will give me that. So can I have some cloud because then I'll just get business agility, won't I? These are the conversations I've actually had. I've actually sat with the post office organization of a European company, a European country, and I sat down with the CIO, and he looked across the table at me, and this is no lie, I promise you. He said, we want some cloud. And I went, well, what do you mean? He says, we want some cloud. We must have cloud by the end of this year. What for? I don't know, what cloud is there, is his question. Well, it depends what problem you're trying to solve. We're fine, we don't have any problems. So, so why do you need cloud? Because our boss says we have to have cloud. I've had that conversation. And I continue to have these conversations with people that are unenlightened. Because they've seen this sales pitch. They've seen that cloud is this new consumption model for IT. It's self-service. It's instantly provisioned. It's pay per use. It's efficient. And it scales up and down. And that's all true. Very true. And it fits in the standard NIST standard definition of cloud. But in reality, as a technologist, cloud is not really that. And I'll get to how it ends up being that. There's something else happened to make that possible. And there's something else happened to make that possible can also happen to your business as well to make that possible for you with your infrastructure and your business. Because cloud's really actually, from a technology perspective, a tale of two trends. The first trend is that monolithic applications or traditional single stack applications are being evolved into distributed services. Do you think Google runs on an Oracle backend? Probably not, okay? In fact, I can tell you they don't, okay? And the platform is moving from loosely connected discrete resources to this virtualized fabric of resources. If you don't have those, there's no point in having scale up and down 
because RDBMSs and their old relational databases do not scale up and down. They tend to scale up, usually involves a checkbook and buying a bigger box, but they don't necessarily scale out. And that's really what a lot of this is about. Because if we look back again at what we've built, if you go back and look at your, your data centers, it's fantastic. It's, it's almost like a, playing an archaeology game. It's sort of a museum to past IT decisions. Okay, and I can almost date stuff. At one point, I worked, I worked on Active Directory at Microsoft, and I could actually, in the, in the early part of this century, date a company, company's Active Directory design by what it looked like. I can tell you what day they came up with that because it was that particular trend at the time. And you can go through data centers and do the same thing. Oh, you've got Unix systems. Nice. Open systems, early 90s, late 80s. You know, that kind of stuff. So, we got a server. We needed some disks, so we put some disk underneath the server. We had a server with some disks attached to it, and then we ran our application, and that was great. And then the business said, we need another application. And we went, oh, okay, well, we'll get another server and some applications and some disks. And then the business said, oh, but that application is really good, but we need another application. They go, oh, okay, we'll buy some more apps and a server and a disk. And we'll manage them all differently and separately because they're all different and separate and important. And then someone, guess what, came from the business and said, do you know what? We need another application. And he went, oh, okay, and bought another application of server and some disks. And then someone came along with a bright idea. They said, oh, we've got all these individual disks, and the problem with the individual disks on these computers is that when the disk fails, the application dies. What if we got, like, a bunch of smaller disks and connected them all together and made them look like a big disk? And so that's what's happened. We had RAID. So we got a bunch of smaller disks. We put this technology on top on RAID, which initially was hardware, but over the years has become entirely done in software. Then we put servers on top of that, and then we put our applications. This was the first cloudy service. Remember what I just said to you? It scales. You can add more disks and get more storage. It's designed for failure. You can lose a disk, and the thing carries on. When you go to the RAID controller and say, I want some storage, you don't say what color of storage you want or how fast it is or what flavor. You just say, I need some storage about this big, please. And it might be that big tomorrow, but I'm not sure. That's RAID. Cloudy. Cool, huh? You just never used it in that way before because back then we hadn't invented the term cloud for branding. We call it things like SANS and NAS and virtual storage and other things to make it sound exciting and you want to buy it, but essentially it's the same thing. And then someone came along and said, oh, what if we put a layer atop the servers that does exactly the same thing as RAID does and make all the servers into one big lump of servers and then we'll come and run virtual servers on top of those and then we get scalability. We can add more servers when we need to. We get if a physical server fails, it's not a problem um, and all the other wonderful things. And then when you go to run your VM so you can run your application, you don't go along and say, I want this server or this plate. If you do, by the way, you're doing it really wrong. Um, but you turn up and say, I need a VM of this size, then you're fine. Great, cool, so that's what we did. Problem was, we didn't actually evolve much at that point. What we did was we took the stuff we'd done here as a server and virtualized it. So if it was bad here, we now had bad virtualized stuff, but that's a different story and a whole different topic. And now what the industry is doing is saying, well, hang on a second, why are we still building VMs? Why don't we just put a layer on top of all the VMs that means that I come to that with my application, and that manages how many VMs I have, failover, expandability, scalability, et cetera, and that's PaaS, which is now where I put my applications. And so really, all we're doing in this cloud evolution, and SaaS, by the way, sits on top of that and always has done. As we evolve through this cloud story, really all we're doing is increasing our level of abstraction and aggregating resources. So why do we do that? Why bother? Why make it that? Well, we're going through what the business went through. Businesses have been transformed, and so will IT, by several major trends, some of which have already happened, some of which are happening to IT, some of which you can help with. So the first was containerization. We all know these 40-foot containers, yeah? Or 20-foot, means you can tell they were invented by either the English or the American, because they're in feet. Okay. Now, the 40-foot container changed the world of shipping. 
because before that you had a special ship for a special type of load. You had a special dock for a special type of load. And that ship went to that dock. And then you had special types of... Did anyone here have a railway set when they were a child? Yeah? Remember you used to have different little carriages for different types of stuff? No, not anymore. It's just all containers. Because someone thought, what if we put them all in the same size box? And then we can have ships that those boxes fit on. And we can have trains that those boxes fit on. And we can have trucks that those boxes fit on. And we can have boxes put for people to live in, which is what happens now. But in essence, it absolutely transformed the world of commerce completely. That's what virtualization is doing for IT. Virtualization has taken workloads that were tied to a particular physical server and lifted them up into a virtual machine that is now portable. You have the ability now to be running a server in one data center and move it whilst it's running to another data center. I know of one service provider that had to do some maintenance on one of its data centers. It didn't tell its customers. It moved all of their running servers, because they were virtualized, from one data center to another. It then turned the old data center off, did some work, brought it back up, and moved them back. And then phoned their customers and say, did you notice anything? Wasn't that cool? That's possible because we separate the workload from where it lives. You don't have ships for particular loads. You just have loads and ships that take any type of load. And that's virtualization, or as we call it, the software-defined data center. Automation, transform business. Don't need to go into that too much. But IT is really bad at automation. We are the worst at using IT for our own stuff. We love writing scripts. We love building things manually. We love having the touch, or as the twiddlers, as one of our customers calls it. We like to touch and hug the server. That's OK when you're managing 10 servers, or when you're managing 100 servers. But I'm going to tell you now, within five years, you will have people in your, in your organization that one admin is managing 1,000 servers or one admin is managing 10,000 servers. And there are organizations already doing this today. Now tell me how someone can manage 10,000 servers without policy-based automation. And that's really what we need in IT. Take away the traditional management in these silos and start to make things into one fluid piece of policy-managed cloud infrastructure. So you need to take breaks of not only the containerization, but also automation. A new wave of automation is coming. Globalization, transformed business, as we now know. You can go and get stuff made in the cheapest place possible. Doesn't matter where it is in the world. I want that stuff made, right, I'm going to get it made in China, or India, or Brazil, or Russia. Don't mind, because it will get shipped to me in a 40-foot container, and I can use it, no problem. And it'll be cheaper than doing it next door. Strangely, that's exactly what's happening in IT. In IT, I'm sorry for the VMware stuff on this, but in IT, what you can do is you can build your infrastructure virtualized in your data center, and if you decide you suddenly want to start operations in Mexico, no problem. Go and find someone who runs a vCloud data center in Mexico and spin it up there. I've got customers that are doing that today. You suddenly want to, and you find it goes wrong. No problem. Turn it off. Didn't cost you anything. Only cost you what you used. You didn't build a data center. You didn't procure a lease. You didn't do anything. You just turned up, used it, walked back, done. Reducing the cost of failure and allowing you to globalize at an incredible rate. All of this is achieved through standardization. And we need standardization. Otherwise, we can't get things done. At the moment, we have piles and piles of customized workloads. Until we standardize those workloads, and virtualize them and put them so they can be on a cloud base, you're still going to have the same management challenges. And so standardization can even go now with software-defined networking and software-defined storage, where you can almost define in software an entire data center as a package. And so you can have a HIPAA-compliant data center, all done in software, SAP, all done in software, sitting on commodity hardware. Now, if you think back to my previous slide, remember the one with the disks, et cetera, et cetera? What happened to disks? Are disks expensive now? Do you even care who makes your disks? Not really. You care about the layer that you talk to the disks through, and that's where all the money is. What's happening to servers now? Do you care about who makes your servers much anymore? You might care about the processor. 
That's about it. When was the last time you actually bought a, a server and said, I don't like the motherboard in that. I want a different one with a different motherboard in. It doesn't happen. You buy the whole server. Soon that'll be buy the whole data center, buy the whole rack. The point at which you interact with services will change as standardization comes. So you will be buying entire racks full of storage, networking, power, um, processing, the whole lot, done. Just something you can run VMs on. And when you've filled that one up, you buy another one. You don't care about what's in it. If you do care about what's in it, you're doing it wrong. Standards reduce this duplication and eliminate these siloed stacks and make them more flexible and scalable. And lastly, to finish up, the market of one. What most commercial organizations that face consumers have realized now is that they are not dealing with several thousand or million people that are all the same. Everyone is different. Everyone wants their own tailored experience. Everyone wants their service to be special and unique to them. Hence the websites, the mobile sites, all these other kind of things and the advertising steps we're taking now to do that. They all want to be different. They all want to be served slightly differently. Well, guess what? So do your users, who are now consumers. They're not all the same. They're all slightly different. They all want to work slightly differently. So what you have to do now is focus on how you're going to build the infrastructure modernize your applications, and change the way you deliver to these people. Because what should you be doing? Well, it's very simple. One of the CIO meetings I had for dinner, last story now, was um, I asked this, you know, what's happening? And one of the CIOs said to me, do you know what? We need to come out from under the table. And I said, come out from under the table? What? And he's kind of, you know, how much have you been drinking? Because we were at dinner. What he meant was, Business's view of IT is the guys under the table. They're the guys that come on their hands and knees and they fix stuff, they plug things in. They're the guys you shout at when it goes wrong. What he said is, we need to come out from under the table. And what we need to do is sit at the table with the business, with ideas on how we can deal with the new world of consumers and how we can help use scalable technologies and the evolving technologies that are available to us to outcompete our competitors, make the big step before the guy in his bedroom does and changes our business, and be a differentiator of the business once again. And so, you do that through three things. You have to look at your end user computing, and then try and work out how you're going to enable freedom whilst maintaining control of your data. At the same time, your applications need modernizing, using new modern frameworks rather than the old ones you're running today. Scale out, not scale up build for failure, and build for tomorrow's applications. And lastly, you need to build cloud infrastructure and management that virtualizes and automates. One of the key things in cloud is designing for failure. You do not design expecting every component to be up all the time. You design expecting that half of your components will disappear at any one time, and that's not a problem. A friend who works for Google, his job is going around turning entire data centers off without warning to test their infrastructure. If I walked into your organization and turned one of your data centers off, do you think you'd go, oh, that's interesting, or something a bit more strong as a response? And um, I don't know, that's exactly what we're doing as three focus areas. And with that, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>